everybody, welcome back to Brombird News. A bit chilly here today, but it's such a welcome change from all the heat and humidity that we've had for the past two weeks. Just like everyone else, I love watching hummingbirds. My favorite observation spot is my kitchen window. So I place my hummingbird feeder in the cedar hedge in front of the window. It also provides a lot of shade and keeps the nectar from spoiling as quickly. The only problem with this location, and especially when I don't have any flowers blooming in this area, just like now, is that the feeder is totally hidden and hummingbirds have no reason to come this way. So I place brightly colored flowers, red mostly, next to my hummingbird feeder. So when hummingbirds are flying around, they see the flowers first and then they see my hummingbird feeder. And then of course having a running sprinkling water feature close to your hummingbird feeder is also super helpful to attract hummingbirds. Melissa Burnham is wondering if Dr. Bird has any suggestions on how to make the bird feeding area raptor proof. Hi Melissa, your property sounds amazing. You are very lucky folks. So glad to hear that while you do wish to make it harder for the raptors to take your feeder birds, you'll still appreciate their existence on the planet as well. I do fully understand your desire to lessen the impact on your feeder birds. Another reason being that the raptor's presence can affect the comfort level of your feeder birds and scare them off for a period. Here is an immediate suggestion for the gazebo roof that you plan to put over your feeders. Instead of using unsightly chicken wire for your gazebo roof, install either parallel wire lines or thin metal conduit pipes about six to eight inches apart running downward on a metal, wooden or plastic frame. It will serve several purposes. First, it'll prevent a hawk or falcon from descending downward on your birds because they usually have their wings outstretched prior to grabbing the bird. Second, that width will also give your feeder birds an upward escape route should the predator be approaching from below, like a cat or another four-legged critter. Third, the open roof concept will prevent most litter from accumulating. Fourth, and without accumulating that litter, it should improve your visibility of your feeders. And finally, if done tastefully, it will look a heck of a lot better than unsightly chicken wire. I've heard that raptors don't like shiny objects catching the sun, like hanging or spinning CDs or DVDs. However, to my knowledge, this has never been tested scientifically. Making sure that your feeder birds have some light cover to dash into nearby, but not robust enough to support a perching hawk or hide a cat, would be useful. Laying down some hawthorn branches below your feeders would definitely make it harder for the cats. But then you do have a dog to keep them away, right? Now as for your tiny dog, you're right to be concerned about potential raptor predation from those bald eagles or any owls the size of a barred owl, great horned owl or more. All of these raptor species have been recorded taking smaller cats and dogs. But note that this is a very rare occurrence. Well, I'm not sure that a flak jacket equipped with spikes is the answer, I suppose it's better than nothing. The ultimate solution in my books is not to leave the dog out in the yard unaccompanied if you're worried about it. Susan Rogg here who lives in Florida is an avid bird watcher. She's also an avid gardener. She has taught me so much. Check out what she does with pineapples. Today I want to do a quick video clip on how to regrow your pineapples that you purchase at the store. Down here is a pineapple that I just bought, arrived today from Whole Foods. And basically you cut off the top of the pineapple, stick it in the dirt, and it will regrow. Here you can see two pineapples that I've actually done that with. This was the initial plant here at the base. Actually there's three, this one hasn't, uh, doesn't have fruit on yet. And you can see that these two have already grown pineapples. And that is Penelope pineapple watering the pineapples in the pineapple garden. So one important thing to look for, and that's why I'm doing this video, is when you purchase your pineapple, you need to look down the top of it right there. And as you can see in this one, 
the inner small leaves have been pinched out. What that basically means is you cannot regrow this pineapple. When you shop for pineapples, you need to look down the center. I'll show you on this one. Look down the center, right there, and you can see all the tiny little leaves. They've not been pinched out, and this top of this pineapple, when I eventually grow it, cut it, and replant it, will regrow itself. So again, when you're purchasing a pineapple, look in the top, you can see right there that it's been pinched out. This came from Whole Foods today, and I will not be able to plant that and regrow it. They take anywhere from two to four years to bear fruit, so you have to be very patient with them. I have them in an earth box right there, <clears throat> and generally I put maybe three or four in at a time and that's it. And they're quite decorative, they look nice in the garden, um, but ironically these two twins in the back row have both bared fruit at the same time, so we are going to have some beautiful pineapples and eventually when that turns yellow, I will cut it, cut off the top and regrow it. So there it is from Penelope's Pineapple Garden. Tampa, Florida, growing zone 9B. Okay, Tatiana, I just checked out the pineapples, as you know, and I noticed something that I've never seen before. Generally, one pineapple plant will make one pineapple. However, in this case over here, this particular pineapple plant has made an offshoot right there, and that itself is a totally separate pineapple, all in the same plant. This is all one plant with its pineapple, but yet it's made a second offshoot. So I'll get two pineapples out of this particular plant. Never seen that before. With hundreds of billions of cicadas emerging from the ground this May and June, in much of the eastern and central U.S., just in time for the beginning of nesting season for our birds, it remains to be seen whether insect-eating birds are taking advantage of this sudden huge bloom of food that's easy to find and just as easy to catch. In other words, will the abundance of these baby finger-sized insects translate into fatter birds producing more eggs and hence more young? These large insects potentially offer a terrific food source for birds because insects in general can satisfy most of their nutritional needs, with the exception of carbohydrates and calcium, because they're rich in amino acids. More than ever before, humans are taking a serious look at including cicadas in their diet. There's now recipes out there, and those who have cooked and ate them claim they taste like a crispy, salty snack. And First Nations folks have historically included them in their diet when available. The best phases to eat are the tenoral and nymph stages, and the least palatable is the adult stage. But back to our birds. It's now common for business-minded folks to grow and sell crickets and mealworms to wild bird feeding stores. So why not farm cicadas? Well, according to one website called Ask an Entomologist, this would be no easy task. One would have to deal with the underground stage, the need for living twigs for them to lay their eggs upon, and hardest of all, to find a way to satisfy their huge appetites by creating an artificial food source. I did wonder though whether an enterprising person could collect loads of the dead cicadas and grind them into a powder-like form to be mixed in with suet. Anyway, that's literally some food for thought. And we're back in Moscow on this episode. Have you ever been to Red Square on the Kremlin? Very impressive. Russia was one of the first countries to train raptors to take down drones, especially drones that were flying around the Kremlin. And this time they're trying to discourage crows from pooping on the spires of the Kremlin. The state's falconry service has hired a snowy owl called Buran, which means a snowstorm, to join their permanent team of six raptors that take care of the drones. The snowy owl is not to attack the crows, but is rather being used as a bait to attract crows. You see, snowy owls are not native to that part of Russia, so crows simply don't know what kind of bird it is. They think that it's some kind of a weak bird that they can scare off easily. So when the crows approach the snowy owl, the rest of the security team, peregrine falcons, eagle owls, and saker falcons appear out of nowhere and take care of the crows. So, so far this is working all right, but crows are such smart birds, I wonder how long it's going to take them to figure this one out. 
a quick follow-up on the Maltese finch trapping situation. As you might remember, the Maltese government changed the wording of their laws to state that all the trapping was being done for scientific research. Well, after a thorough investigation conducted by BirdLife International and BirdLife Malta, the European Commission issued a directive and gave the Maltese government a month to change the wording of their laws and to stop finch trapping completely. Malta is infamous for ignoring EU regulations, but hopefully they'll take this directive more seriously. Well, it's time to say goodbye. I hope your hummers will be back or you'll be able to attract them. This season is so much fun to watch. Have fun regrowing your pineapples. Take care, everyone. I'll see you in two weeks.